Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue our conversation on Australian nuclear issues with Dave Sweeney of the Australian Conservation Foundation. This time, we focus on the international nuclear industry's plans, already in motion, to make Australia the nuclear waste dump for the world, with a propaganda spin planned out over more than 20 years and a direct, immediate, and recent Rupert Murdoch connection. We also talk with Sean McGee in Ireland to give some context on the nuclear situation in Europe and the UK. And we check in on the latest Westlake Landfill Environmental Protection Agency meeting with the architect of yesterday's die-in demonstration, Alex Cohen of So Much Matters. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness. The nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than Donald Trump's newly hired media advisor, Fox News' disgraced sexual predator-in-chief Roger Ailes, will ever soundbite for his current mouthpiece. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, August 16, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Let's start in the U.S. with the bad news. It appears that there was a fire at H area. I don't know if that stands for H bomb or not, but it's H area of the Savannah River nuclear site. U.S. fire satellite mapping reported on Sunday, August 7, a little afternoon local time, what seems to have been a fire, though there has been no larger announcement of this situation. H. Canyon in this area was a high-tech facility in the 1950s, and it's where the German government is currently trying to send its pebble bed nuclear waste balls. Nuclear reactor duck! (coughs) And cover report. On August 13 at Watts Bar in Tennessee. Again Watts Bar! What is this, the fifth time since they tried starting this new thing up? I swear, we need a lemon law for this nuclear reactor. Anyway, on August 13, the automatic start of a turbine-driven auxiliary feed water pump didn't work. The steam generator water level lowered to the low, low alarm set point, as opposed to merely the low alarm set point. I guess they were trying to emphasize it. The water pump automatically started with steam generator water levels actually lower than the low, low alarm set point which I guess would be low, 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 except they don't have that as one of their contingencies. Anyway, the thing is on hot standby, and it's just a hot mess. (coughs) Also on August 13 at Prairie Island in Minnesota, an unusual event was called, and that's a technical listing. There is nothing more usual than a quote-unquote unusual event at a nuclear reactor. The cause of the unusual event was excessive reactor coolant system leakage. I can figure out nothing more specific about what happened because of excessive NRC verbiage. Not an accident. (coughs) And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound weak. Entergy, that slumlord of nuclear facility owners announced on August 9th that it is to assume ownership and operation of Entergy's Fitzpatrick Nuclear Power Plant in upstate New York, following the state's adoption of a clean energy standard that supports the continued operation of nuclear. Exelon also operates the two other loser nukes in upstate New York, Nine Mile Point and Jinnah. Then, only three days later, then, only three days later, Exelon announced that it will continue to advocate for public policy that recognizes the clean energy attributes of nuclear plants. Pardon me while I puke. But Exelon has also warned that it will have no choice but to close those plants if they remain unprofitable. Uh, excuse me, but 
if a business isn't profitable, isn't that the definition of a business that must close? But no, this is nuclear. And much as the producers showed that you can make more money from a flop Broadway show than a hit, you can make more money off of a losing, failing nuclear reactor than you can solar, wind, or geothermal. Here's how. As ACE investigative journalist Greg Pallas let us know on Nuclear Hot Seat number 264, a failing nuke is the gift that gives on giving. It is the teat with endless milk that feeds the nuclear industry. Greg was referring to the Shoreham facility on Long Island that ran one day and cost $20 billion because every year they told their governmental overlords, gee, we're just a little behind schedule. We're going to go a little long. We need another half billion dollars. And they did that for 12 years. That's an extra $6 billion of the $20 billion that it cost and the dang thing only ran for one day. Using that as the model, it is now clear that Exelon owns the trifecta of nuclear sucks in upstate New York. Ah, Andrew Cuomo, what does Jeffrey Epstein have on you to make you open that Pandora's box of limitless funds to a deadly industry? That's not green energy, that's greed energy. Personally, I would let Entergy walk away with their ball, bat, and first base. But, of course, they would never take the waste. Nobody ever wants the waste. Which all adds up to Entergy this week in the evil numbnuts category. You are... Nuclear Hot Seed, numbnuts of the week. Let's get some better news in here. The Environmental Protection Agency held another in its long string of tawdry, let's manage public perception meetings on the Westlake landfill, the encroaching Bridgeton landfill fire, now estimated at between 500 and 700 feet from buried nuclear waste, and why the EPA won't let the Army Corps of Engineers take this nightmare off their hands. But this time, there was a new wrinkle in the public meeting. I spoke with Alex Cohn of So Much Matters, who helped organize this new, dramatic, and hopefully effective tactic. Tell us how you got involved with the Westlake landfill protests at the EPA. I saw a post about a protest in front of an EPA meeting about two years ago, and then went to the protest and went to the meeting and got to learn about the issue. And then I met the moms in St. Louis from Just Moms STL, like Dawn and Karen. They're busy a lot of the time, so I kind of helped from there, started planning direct actions and protests to alleviate the burden from them so they could focus on talking to EPA and having those conversations because they've studied it for so long. I could focus on so much water in my organization, stirring up the pot, you know, to make EPA feel uncomfortable in public. So hopefully we'll get some action. Tell us about the action that took place yesterday, where it was and what you hope to accomplish. The EPA held their community dialogue meeting where they were going to talk about other options except for full removal. And they had said that they were not going to consider groundwater contamination or study the groundwater in their record of decision. So we were protesting beforehand. We did a demonstration and we protested demanding that no other option is acceptable unless it involves full removal of all the ways and that groundwater should be included in that decision. So we did that protest beforehand, and they kind of moved us to where we weren't really on a public road, and so we wanted to give the EPA their chance to hold their meeting and say what they had to say, and they fed us the same crap, basically, that they'd always fed us, that they're looking into other decisions with partial removal, and they're not going to consider groundwater, and really didn't care to answer any of our questions. So at the end of the meeting, I'd say about 10 to 15 of us stood up and lay down in the center of the round table where the EPA hand selected people from the community's voices to be heard, which is a crappy way to hold a public meeting. But anyway, so we lay down in the middle of the uh, round table on the ground with masks on and a sign that said, when scientists lie, people die. And we staged a die-in and we chanted things like, save our lives, full removal, 
The fire is dire, republic's a liar, and when scientists lie, people die. Why did you choose a dying, and where did you learn this technique? I actually learned the technique of a dying at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. We took Westlake Landfill um, to the national stage there. So I was working with a friend, Casey, of mine, who had learned the dying from, like, a lot of Black Lives Matter movements. So we did die-ins at the DNC that were extremely effective, and the videos went viral with 11,000 views, and a sitting House member, Lacey Clay, retweeted it. So I figured what better than to put a dying corpse at the foot of the EPA in front of their faces to make them realize the reality of the situation. What was the response in the room? I was hard because we were laying on the ground and chanting, but from what I'm hearing from other people... It was like no one wanted to act like they saw it, you know, because it's a hard thing to process. But I know that the EPA director has actually stayed in the room for the whole course of it. We probably laid there and chanted for six to seven minutes. What's next? We definitely need to turn up the fire. You know, this community has been dealing with EPA for 26 years. So it's obvious they don't care. They still have a job no matter what, and they don't have to live here. So it's like the only way to get them to do something is to make them feel uncomfortable or to hurt their reputation. So I, there's definitely going to be more civil, peaceful disobedience because, you know, the petitioning is great and the protests are great, but it's obviously not working. Because here we are 26 years later and they're still saying, we just want to make the right decision, so we're going to take our time. And we don't have time, you know. Alex Cohen of So Much Matters. We'll have a link up to his Facebook page where you can see a whole bunch of pictures and videos of the die-in. More action? Seven nonprofits have filed an injunction to keep liquid radioactive waste off our highways. Sounds good to me. 150 truckloads of inherently dangerous liquid radioactive waste are slated to drive through Canada and U.S. communities and across major waterway crossings from Chalk River, Ontario, Canada, to the Savannah River site in South Carolina, where, you may recall, there was an unreported fire on August 7. Beyond nuclear, Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, Citizens for Alternatives to Chemical Contamination, Environmentalists Incorporated, Lone Tree Council, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, and Savannah Riverside Watch and Sierra Club have all participated in the lawsuit, which is being filed against the Department of Energy and National Nuclear Security Administration on behalf of a number of organizations whose individual members live along the potential transport routes. Oglala Sioux scientist, environmentalist, and activist Charmaine Whiteface has been named a giraffe hero by the Giraffe Heroes Project, a nonprofit organization that encourages people to stick their necks out for the common good. Whiteface was chosen for her battles against corruption within tribal governments and her fight against uranium mining in the Black Hills. Charmaine Whiteface, as my tribal people like to say, Mazel tov. And two important articles this week. The first by Bob Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, nuclear power plant or storage dump for hot radioactive waste, on the problems of high burn-up spent power reactor fuel, and Harvey Wasserman's The Real Battle Is, Who's Going to Own the Energy Supply? We'll have links to both up on our Missing link section of Nuclear Hot Seat number 269. Over to Japan, where Shikoku Electric Power Company has announced as of August 12th that it had initiated the process of restarting Unit 3 of its Ikata nuclear power plant in Japan's Aihime Prefecture. This becomes the fifth Japanese reactor to resume operation following the March 11, 2011 triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi facility. At Fukushima... At least 300 tons of tritium-contaminated water is generated daily at the facility in order to cool the triple meltdown of the reactors. And concern is mounting in Japan over the planned release of this radioactive tritium into the Pacific Ocean. According to the Associated Press, Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, the operators of the ruins of the plant, is expected to start releasing the water later this year, pending a final political decision. 
Experts in Japan and around the world have expressed alarm about the potential impact of radioactive contamination entering into the ocean on such a scale. There are more than 1,000 large tanks that have been filled with the discarded cooling water, which is laced with radioactive tritium. The governor of Fukushima Prefecture has officially objected to a plan by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry to build a sarcophagus, a stone coffin, around the Fukushima facility. This is the step that was taken by Russia at Chernobyl. The governor demanded the removal of nuclear fuel debris and disposal of it outside of Fukushima. The senior vice minister of Meiti apologized and stated that they have never considered a sarcophagus and will try to complete the removal of all nuclear fuel debris in Fukushima. It's all a dance. It's a public performance full of sound and fury signifying absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, Hervé Courtois, who is known and respected throughout the anti-nuclear movement, has translated an article on Fukushima's disaster victims. He wrote, I decided to translate this article because, for a change, it talks about the Fukushima disaster victims and details how their everyday lives have been altered. In most of the Fukushima-related articles from websites and mainstream media, the writers usually focus on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and its technical failures, about its continuous leaking into the Pacific Ocean, but somehow they almost always forget to talk about the plight of the victims who are at the forefront of this tragedy. We'll link to it on the website. Internationally, Russia has announced its intention to build 11 new nuclear reactors by 2013. They also claim to have identified six points for radioactive waste disposal. Good luck with that one. And do not just go dump it in a lake like you did with Karachai Cherkessia back in the 1950s, where these days a one-hour exposure to the lake will kill you quickly. In much better news, Scotland recently met 106 percent of its energy needs with wind. Admittedly, it took violent hurricane force winds ripping across Scotland on Sunday, August 7, to generate the record-setting levels of renewable energy, but hey, it's an ill wind that blows no good. And this one blew just under 40,000 megawatt hours of electricity. Onshore wind is the biggest source of renewable energy in Scotland, but the country also boasts nearly 200 megawatts of offshore wind and hopes to one day be the world leader in tidal power. What a goal! That is what top-down leadership in a country can lead to. When it comes to the international problem of nuclear, every country, every region has a different set of political stress points. In an attempt to help create an understanding of the European and UK perspective for Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, today we present the first in an occasional series of brief talks with Sean McGee, known online as Sean Arclight. He is a reporter, researcher, podcaster, and all-around great activist on nuclear and other issues. Today, he addresses the manipulations leading up to the COP21 in Paris, COP standing for Conference of Parties, with parties meaning the countries that ratified the United Nations Convention on Climate Change in 1992. The stated and agreed-upon objective of this agreement is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to prevent dangerous levels of human interference with the climate system. Too late for that, but anyway, here's Sean to tell us more about it. This is Sean McGee reporting for Nuclear Hot Seat uh, from Europe and I'm actually based in Ireland. I'm going to be reporting this week on European Union nuclear issues. I'm going to go straight to October 2015. There was a call from 4Atom, which is based in Brussels. Uh, you can see it's a nuclear industry uh, promotion committee. They have asked that 100 nuclear power reactors are created over the next 35 years Coming on a little bit further to November 30th of that same year, 2015, we had COP21. We can see how that works. Basically, we're looking for a push in October 
four atom are pushing forward, uh, and then we have a COP21 in Paris very shortly afterwards. Clearly, in COP21, of course, we're aware that they excluded many independent pro renewable energy journalists. We knew that they blocked uh, Charles Williams Diggs from uh, Bologna who basically was explaining to us that they didn't want independent journalists at COP21 in Paris. So they used the threat of terrorism to keep them away. But it was a common thing that they did all the time. The private conversations and sort of takeaway from the COP21 ended up being kind of for nuclear energy as a source to deal with climate change. Coming forward a bit further, in February the 2nd, 2016, a leaked report from the European Commission found that financial costs of nuclear plans for Europe would come to some estimated 450 to 550 billion euros. And they're kind of based on nuclear costs and what have you. As we know, they go up all the time, especially for new reactors. And, of course, there's a question mark over reactors that are being extended. The report also noted that with this investment, nuclear generation in Europe would still see a decrease in the overall nuclear capacity from 27% today to some 17 to 21%. Also in the nuclear-related investments, it was estimated in the same report to be some 3 trillion to 2015, over 35 years. Now, the EU has uh, about 500 million, half billion. So that was a sixth of the total. And of course, you know, when you're looking at China, USA and Japan, where China is investing 120 billion in sort of renewable solar and wind technology and only 20 billion in nuclear. Of course, Japan is having, you know, reactors start up and then be shut down. And we have in the USA, well, there's carnage in the USA because of these anti-nuclear activists that are over there, Libby. Anyway, we've got further issues with the German Green Party noted that the EU Commission had downplayed the costs associated with reactor extension and waste disposal. They also claimed that the EU Commission had, quote, painted a rosy picture for the future of EU nuclear energy. So, going a bit further on, we have to sort of ask ourselves, so, you know, how is the nuclear industry faring since these reports came out and uh, some of them were uh, reported on? And, uh, of course, that affects on the investment uh, overall. And so, for the first half of 2016, no nuclear reactor bills anywhere in the world. Okay, this is just after for Atom are calling for massive investment, pushing COP21 saying, yeah, let's do it, and it's not really happening. Now, we have a report from Guthen Ottinger's plans that were put forward in 2012, just after the Fukushima disaster. He was the EU Energy Commissioner, and seeing the nuclear disaster in Japan and the costs that had occurred, and of course we've had one in Chernobyl, and we've got a nasty smelly reactor in Hungary, and various other reactors as well, obviously all over Europe, and waste disposal. So while we've got that going on, he actually said that for nuclear reactors that there should be a liability insurance set up, a uniform European liability insurance. And, uh, of course, that would allow nuclear power plants to get an honest assessment and a functioning insurance would provide more honest assessment of the overall cost of nuclear power. And we see that those costs aren't added to the cost of nuclear power, nor are research costs. Just to let you know, uh, 131 nuclear power plants are in Europe, in 14 EU countries, on average about 30 years old. And that's a reference from Handelsblatt, a report which was from March 2016. That will be winding up this particular report for Nuclear Hot Seat from Europe. I'm Sean McGee, and back to uh, Libby Halevi. We'll be hearing more from Sean in the coming weeks on nuclear issues in the United Kingdom, Europe, and the impact of Brexit on nukes. And the second thematic World Social Forum for a Nuclear Fission-Free World, conducted in Montreal from August 8 to 12, collectively calls for a mobilization of civil society around the world to bring about the elimination of all nuclear weapons, to put an end to the continued mass production of all high-level nuclear wastes by phasing out all nuclear reactors, and to bring to a halt all uranium mining worldwide. If you wish to endorse this declaration as a person, a group, or an organization, you can do so by sending your name and email address to ccnr 
at web.ca. Link on our website, of course. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, donations are the lifeblood of Nuclear Hot Seat. They help cover the monthly online charges, social media outreach, and provide the funds for travel to cover events important to this community and our cause. One of the most important of the year is the annual Excellence in Journalism Conference, where more than 1,000 reporters, news directors, syndicators, and all levels of nuclear professionals gather to talk shop, learn tools, and sometimes learn about stories they otherwise would not know to cover, like ours. I'm also going to be asking professional newsroom staff what, if any, support or obstruction they've met with when they've attempted to cover nuclear stories. I'm looking forward to that one a lot. I'm still in active fundraising to cover the expenses, so won't you help send me into the belly of the beast to see what I can see and report back to you? Your donation of any size will be greatly appreciated. Anything from the equivalent of a cup of expensive coffee to a MacArthur Foundation grant or its equivalent. If you look forward to listening to Nuclear Hot Seat, if you believe in exposing that glowing little man behind the nuclear curtain so that we get information out from our perspective, help me secure the rest of the funds I need to do this trip upright. It's easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal, or you can use your credit card. And if you prefer the old-fashioned way by sending in a check, you can get a snail mail address by sending an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Whatever you can do to help, know that you have my gratitude and will be an immediate part of anything I can do at Excellence in Journalism. This week, we bring you part two of the interview with Dave Sweeney, National Nuclear Campaigner for the Australian Conservation Foundation. Dave has been active in the uranium mining and nuclear debate for two decades through his work with the media, trade unions, and environmental groups on mining, resource, and indigenous issues. He holds a vision of a nuclear-free Australia that is positive about its future and honest about its past. This week, we get to the heart of the international manipulation. Dare I call it a conspiracy? In any way, they're coordinating with each other to be able to dump the world's nuclear waste on the land down under. The one that emerges every now and again is the question of Australia as home to the world's nuclear waste, or at least a portion of it. And the argument runs that Australia is a big country, a reasonably geologically and politically stable country. There's large areas of desert or undeveloped country with small populations. Surely some of it could be fenced off, a hole dug, and the world's radioactive waste put there. And that argument may have some appeal and certainly has appeal with utilities around the world and in other countries and other capitals, but it has long been rejected here by people saying that this is our country, we love it, every part of it is special and it's not a dumping ground. And there has been a, earlier attempts in the 1990s by a group called Pangea Resources to try and come in by stealth and advance an international dump and they've failed because of a strong community reaction. But just recently and right now in Australia, there is a renewed and very, very well resourced very well considered and positioned and orchestrated push for Australia to explore hosting up to one third of the world's high level radioactive waste living. And there has been a state inquiry in South Australia, which is a state that is home to the world's largest uranium deposit at Olympic Dam. And so it's reasonably, some in the government, supportive of the nuclear industry. The, the state is on hard times. Its manufacturing sector is reduced and shrinking and under pressure. Unemployment's up. Income streams are down. And the government is looking desperately at any option that might turn a dollar in this place. So they've commissioned a high-level inquiry, which is reported... And its terms of reference were to look at all sorts of opportunities across the nuclear sector. It said no opportunity in uranium, no opportunity in enrichment or reprocessing, no opportunity in nuclear power. But it said there is money 
Its language was there is potential for significant intergenerational economic benefit from waste. And oh. South Australia has the attributes and capabilities to undertake and import international radioactive waste. So the issue is back, not in a surreptitious way, but in a way with all sorts of carpet baggers, but then many other commentators and people that you'd expect a different response from now saying perhaps we should explore whether this is a direction we should go. It's a very well-funded campaign. There's $10 million that's been put into it by the state government to date. It's accompanied by a social media campaign called New Clear, with a question mark, and it is all talking about Australia's responsibility, but above all, it's talking about economic opportunity. The major newspaper in the state where this is being talked about and discussed at the moment, Libby, has described this issue as stupendous amounts of money. Imagine Scrooge McDuck swimming in rivers of gold. <laughs> and all I can think of is the term you used a moment ago, which was intergenerational opportunity, because, of course, the intergenerational DNA damage and the health impact will never go away and it will continue through the generations for as long as there are generations. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and what's happened and what we're trying to do, it's a slow ship to turn around when there's this massive media avalanche at you. But what we're trying to do now is say, OK, OK, you're talking lots of dollars. Let's look at what else there might be lots of. There might be lots of risk. There might be lots of danger. There might be lots of adverse health impacts. There might be lots of unintended consequence, like suddenly your market for quality food, agriculture, wines your market for tourism starts to dry up as the perception and the reality of such a project hits. So it's not all one-way traffic economically. It's also the fact here that there, there has been so much that has been gilded where material has been edited out of consideration. When we presented to this inquiry in our submission, we spoke, obviously, as you would imagine, about the example of WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plan in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Like there was an existing world deep geological repository. And so we said, let's have a look at this because it's in America, which is technically sophisticated and has a long he nuclear history, much more experienced than Australia. And it's a deep hole in the earth that's burying radioactive waste, which is what you're proposing to do. So let's have a look at it because it went wrong. It caught fire, it shut down, radiation leaked, it's a mess. Let's look at Yucca Mountain again. All those things were either explicitly ruled out from consideration or just airbrushed away. WIP was not considered because they said, oh, that's military waste, this would be different. Again and again, this whole process has been very, very controlled, manufactured. It's a classic textbook case Libby, in the manufacturing of consent and in the use of ticker box exercises and hard-to-navigate websites as a surrogate for real democratic and transparent and open decision-making. We're deeply concerned about this. It was loaded terms of reference. It was a loaded commissioner. There was a, a panel of experts, 60% of whom were not just pro-nuclear but active, almost aggressive advocates for nuclear trips overseas by the commission visited overwhelmingly industry proponents and advocates not critics even though lists of critics that you should speak to were supplied aboriginal people requested repeatedly the key material on an issue that would impact because they're not going to put radioactive waste if they got away with it in adelaide the principal city they'd put it in a remote area where is predominantly aboriginal land Material was not provided in language, it was not interpreted, there was not time given. Everything about it is being rushed. There's a decision by the government at the end of 2016 through a process that reported in the mid-2016. We're saying, what's your rush? This stuff lasts for hundreds of thousands of years, you don't have to hurry. But the Royal Commission himself has said, this is a business opportunity that we should advance as swiftly as possible. And you would know, your listeners would know, that with radioactive waste, you don't make hurried decisions. 
you don't make stupid decisions and you don't see one of the world's most complex environmental management problems as a short-term business opportunity. Except that's exactly what is happening because the pressure is mounting in the United States as reactors are closing and more communities are becoming aware of the fact that they are saddled with the waste. There's all kinds of manipulation going on around perception, around languaging. In the U.S., buying the cheapest possible dry casks that can corrode in a sea environment, which, of course, so many reactors are on the ocean, so it's a seawater environment. They can corrode in 20 years, and there is no long-term responsibility. Plus, nobody's factoring in that there is what's called mobile Chernobyl potential, that in any step along the way of waste being shipped to any of these locations, there could be an accident. Certainly, we've had many trains carrying oil that have exploded, that have run off the tracks, that have created huge fires, that have killed people. So who's to say that that's not going to happen to a train that is carrying radioactive material, some of this waste, or on ships that are crossing the ocean, that it's not going to sink, it's not going to run up on shoals. There isn't going to be a terrorist attack somewhere out in the ocean. So there are multiple and exponentially growing factors that have not been considered by this industry that's in the process of poisoning us all. That's exactly right in that sense of there are, are multiple factors. They are growing and there are factors that are unresolved and many that seem unresolvable and particularly in the, the security context and the global context of today. This issue of radioactive waste management is probably one of the greatest environmental challenges that we, we face. I am confident that we will, over time, remove ourselves from the nuclear industry. It's happening in the Western world. You can you just track it. You look at the world uh, nuclear industry status reports. You look at new builds. You look at what's actually being produced and, it's, and nuclear electricity's contribution to the global market share. Like, it's falling. Renewables are growing. The cost curve is shifting. We all know how that's tracking. We know that there might be a China spike, but we know that that's also constrained and limited and it won't replace what has to come offline from ageing reactors, etc, etc. So it's going one way, but it's not going one way in a hurry. And the, certainly the thing that's not in a hurry is radioactive waste. We get, as you know, as your listeners know, we put a fuel rod in, we get three years of electricity out of a reactor. We take that fuel rod out and we now have 300,000 years of radioactive waste. Three years of cold beers, hot water, 300,000 years of cancer-causing waste. And that is such a bad trade-off. The return ratio is so poor, it is so irresponsible, and it is so profoundly unnecessary. And I think one of the real challenges that we're going to have in your country, in my country, in many places, is as the industry winds down to ensure, just as the same way we have to track them when they end their mine, same way we need to transfer that tracking and tenacity to when they end their reactor. We can't let them, when they end their mine, cut and run, and we can't let them, when they end their reactor, dump and run. I like to say that Earth is a rock in the middle of a bubble, in the middle of nowhere. And what happens on Earth stays on Earth. We are all connected on this issue. So even though you are down in Australia, you're but a nano away from the rest of us on this issue. What can we, what can the listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat do to help support you in your efforts in Australia? Well, picking up that question of connection, I, th I think we are very connected on this issue of waste because we, we dig up the uranium, part of which fuels reactors in the States and elsewhere, which is a problem for those communities where those reactors are housed. Then that dirty fuel rod's pulled out and that's waste, and that's a problem. But then if you want to send it back to Australia, that's not a solution for anywhere else because that's just enabling. That enables that whole cycle to continue. So one of the real constraints then on the industry, one of the things that is actually forcing the industry to stop and to change and to be exited is gone, one of those checks and balances. So I think our 
causes, our needs and our threats are, are linked here. And, and an injury to one in this case really is an injury to all. So I really appreciate the question because of the uh, underpinning of solidarity that it reflects. We are a small sort of uh, movement in Australia. We punch above our weight and we do well and we're proud and effective and we're committed and we're serious about getting rid of this industry and stopping uranium mining in this country. So we want to keep the door locked to international waste dumping. This is an area that we don't have that high level of expertise that many of your listeners would have or many of the international networks will have. We don't deal with reactor waste in a level like many people who have these commercial facilities or commercial reactors would. So we'd welcome expertise, we'd welcome support, contact, community. So I suppose the thing is for those who have some experience, some connection, some learnings that they could share, we'd be very open to that. And I suppose there'd be like this conversation today. I've found it really interesting and really productive and I've really enjoyed the opportunity and I think you know perhaps in a sense that's what we're doing we are down here a long way from anywhere else in a sense but we're not closed mind we're not insular we are very international in how we see things we're just a long way from where most other people are so I suppose it's the start of a conversation about how can we ensure that we can work together increase maybe more dedicated cooperation to ensure that companies that have acted irresponsibly as power producers now can't act irresponsibly be it in the states or elsewhere by targeting Australia as the solution to the problem that they've created and that they're now trying to hide. Dave, whatever we can do on Nuclear Hot Seat to carry this story as it moves forward and to facilitate the connection, we will definitely do. How can people contact you if that is what they wish to do to share their expertise or just give you a good word and support in whatever way they can? Probably, Libby, the best way is through the website of ACF, the Australian Conservation Foundation, which is um, www.acf, Australian Conservation Foundation, acfonline.org.au. And that's a really good start. And I very much welcome your offer of continuing support. And when things get a little bit sharper and harder and when some of the key players drop the shadows and drop the niceties of a community conversation and show really when and how they want to advance the Australian International Radioactive Waste Proposal. Libby, I'd love to know, I'm very happy to know, that we can get back in touch with a more specific request for assistance or a more specific sounding of the alarm and that there'll be people there to hear it. At that point, I went into my usual conclusion to a nuclear hot seat featured interview, asking Dave to stay in touch with any updates. Little did we realize at the time that only a few days after we recorded this interview, Dave would contact me with the following truly alarming update. Consider this breaking news. Dave, as I was about to go into the editing of our interview, you contacted me and let me know that there has been a new development in Australia, specifically as regards the creation of Australia or the attempt to create Australia as the world's radiation dump. Bring us up to speed as to these latest developments. Absolutely happy to do that, Libby, because it's a story that really needs to be told. We have long been concerned, environment groups in Australia, about the credibility, the independence and the impartiality of, of the evidence that's informing a very strong push in Australia to revisit the idea of hosting international radioactive waste. Since we last spoke, we have formally confirmed that a person who was a key architect in an earlier and failed attempt to open an international radioactive waste dump in Australia, a group called Pangea Resources tried and failed in the 1990s. Their technical manager at the time was a chap called Charles McCombie. He then was very closely associated with the push to open a dump in Australia. When that was unsuccessful, he uh, was a key person in forming a lobby organisation called ARIUS, the Association for Regional and International Underground Storage, 
And he also set up a consulting company in Switzerland called MCM. Now, MCM has been contracted and paid public money by the South Australian Royal Commission looking at nuclear waste dumping to provide key economic data. Now, it provided data on customer expectations, price predictions, market demand, and a whole range of assumptions which has really significantly helped to inform what is a very enthusiastic and very optimistic and upbeat assessment from the Royal Commission, which in turn is propelling the discussion in Australia about radioactive waste dumping. So the long and short of it is a person who 20 years ago was chased out of Australia because of public opposition to waste dumping, then sets up a company which is now in receipt of public funding to revisit and rewrite that same plan. So we have formally raised these concerns with the South Australian Government and Parliament and we have deep concerns about the credibility and the independence of this information and we believe that it has compromised the final report and this report is now deeply deficient and unfit for purpose. What steps do you have beyond the raising of the issues that you have done so far? Is there legal recourse or are you waiting to get a response before you take the next steps? We are waiting first to get a formal response from the government to our concerns. There are a range of opportunities. There's limited procedural opportunities and legal opportunities are difficult until an action has been taken, until an event has been developed that has caused a harm that's resulted from. We want to stop this. We don't want to seek redress afterwards. So we, rather than using the courts, will be hoping very strongly over the next few months to use the Court of Public Appeal and to raise the question with ordinary people in South Australia and across Australia to say, listen, if you are considering something as significant, as permanent, as risky as importing one-third of the world's high-level radioactive waste... Don't you think that the people who do the sums, don't you think that the people who write the plan should be as open, as independent, as expert and as non-partisan as possible? And I think the common sense, common person test will fall in our favour. I, I certainly hope so. We are, we are really concerned that there is a series of closed-door agreements here and a series of industry insiders that are pushing a predetermined agenda. There's nothing transparent or open about what is being advanced in Australia. It's being guided down a path that would see ships pulling up at a port and unloading one third of the world's waste to be trucked onto Aboriginal land. And that is a future that we are determined to resist. What degree of media cooperation have you traditionally experienced around this issue or do you expect to experience around this issue? Are they open? Will they cover it? Or are they going to be in alignment with the powers that be and simply refuse to give you a platform? That is a very fine question and as all activists and all people working for some sort of social change know, one of the things that you need to do to affect change is, is to raise the issue, is to have an awareness in the, in the minds of, of people that there is an issue in the first place. We have been quite successful in doing that in different periods in the past. One real difficulty in the current context is that this is happening on a state or provincial level. It's happening in the state of South Australia. And South Australia is a very, very restricted media market. There's one daily newspaper that services the state. It is owned by Rupert Murdoch. It was actually the first paper, the Foundation Murdoch paper. And so it has a very special place in whatever there is of Rupert's heart. It carries very much the Murdoch stamp. It is very, very enthusiastic and pro-dump. We find it very difficult to break through. And today, as one example, in this paper today that circulated around South Australia, there is a 25-page paid supplement on the nuclear waste dump proposal. So we are outbid we are outgunned, we are outvoiced in those forums, but we are determined to find 
other ways to tell this story. We still have a high quality national broadcaster in this country, which is a, a great asset and a pivot for democracy. We still have a vibrant, independent and community and indigenous media sector. So the stories mightn't get out in a tabloid form to everyone at the one time, but we are trickling and dribbling out these stories and we hope that there will be enough to crack the damn wall and to get the bigger picture out. We have got some significant coverage of this connection. We certainly want to get more. And we also want to reach out to people internationally because... MCM, the company that Charles McCombie started, the company that's been contracted to provide information, MCM has said that if the South Australian government takes a positive approach for this, it will change the worldwide paradigm of radioactive waste management. And we know what the subtext of that means. It means you can clear the constraints and you can point and reassure the regulators and you can seek licence extensions for dodgy reactors and you can move material not safely, not securely, not thoughtfully, but just so it's away from public view. That's of no benefit for anyone, either on a host country, a receiving country, a sending country. We need to end the nuclear trade, not relocate and further extend its mess. Dave Sweeney of the Australian Conservation Foundation. There will be a link up so that you can reach Dave and see some of his work on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 269. And trust me, we will continue to be in touch, and I will bring you all developments as I receive them. Activist shout-out! This time it goes to Kumar Sundaram the Indian anti-nuclear activist who is in Japan right now. He wrote, You know about the Friday anti-nuclear protest in Tokyo, in which people have been organizing demos and sit-ins every Friday evening in front of the Prime Minister's office. This protest started after a few months of the Fukushima accident in 2011 and has continued since then. I have participated in the demo every time I have come to Japan and sometimes have addressed large gatherings of 10,000 or more people, as on some Fridays they give calls for bigger protests. Starting tomorrow, meaning Friday, August 12, I will sit every Friday there in a corner. I will get people's signatures on an appeal against the proposed India-Japan nuclear agreement, display pictures from Kudankulam and other protests, Use other material, such as the open letter that women from Kudankulam have written in the past on the issue. I will do this until November, hoping it will put some pressure on the government to rethink the deal when Indian Prime Minister Modi comes here in December. Kumar, we wish you all luck, all success, and are there with you in spirit. Here's today's final thought. Sometimes the information that comes together for each week's nuclear hot seat astonishes me. In this one episode, you can see the nuclear industry's entire playbook. Radioactive waste never goes away and continues to impact us invisibly. Witness the devastating health impact of the Westlake Landfill Coldwater Creek issue in North St. Louis. And the government, as embodied by the Environmental Protection Agency, has no interest in cleaning things up, only in managing perception and public panic. Even with a westernized country, Scotland, producing more than the energy it needs in a day through genuine renewables, European interests continue to pressure to build more nukes, even as they continue to mismanage the waste. So what to do about the deadly nuclear waste issue? Bury it under the rug, down under the rug, as in Australia, the nuclear industry's designated contamination zone for nuclear waste. People are concerned about radiation? Hey, change their perception. Jigger the world's media to call nuclear clean, green, carbon-free, the answer to climate change, and the best thing since sliced bread, though I don't know what's so good about sliced bread. Get the billionaire media moguls to print 25-page supplements to inundate the population with propaganda to convince them that this garbage will not put them in harm's way, which it will do forever. And while it's not specifically on the show this week, 
percolating in the background is the push to get the way we measure radiation's impact on human health changed from the gold standard of linear no threshold, which states and has scientific footnotes up the yin-yang to prove that no amount of radiation exposure is safe. It's cumulative, it's dangerous, and we need to not do it to ourselves. But that means nothing to the whores who push hormesis, which spews lies meant to convince us all that, hey, a little radiation is good for you. And alas, the media and even the Nuclear Regulatory Commission are considering this as the change in how we perceive radiation. Basically, the international nuclear industry is saying, we own this world. And we will do whatever we like with it because, hey, our money is more important than your life. Well, I don't think so. I don't agree with them, and I doubt that you do either. So let's find a way to demonstrate our position. Let's keep finding various ways to have public die-ins before this stuff kills us for real. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 16, 2016. Material from this week's program has been researched and compiled from deunrenard.wordpress.com, japantimes.com, miningawareness.wordpress.com, beyondnuclear.org, rapidcityjournal.com, greenriverstar.com, fair.org, thebulletin.org, greentechmedia.com, ccnr.org, telegraph.co.uk, fukushima-diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, the soul-dead cubicle drones who sold their literary aspirations for a mess of radioactive pottage when they agreed to write for World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the totally awesome anti-nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook. That's where you're invited to join us and like us and share our posts with your family and friends. Thanks also to items from Nuclear Hot Seat friends Kathy Wani and Hervé Courtois. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilyn Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. If you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station, satellite station, anything that would like to carry this show in part or whole, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. If you go to our website and fill out that little form, you will receive an emailed link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat in your email inbox. And as a bonus, you'll receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. Full book available on Amazon. And a reminder, your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. So if you think you're alone with these issues, you're not alone. The activists are linking because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, please, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. The 
This is Ozzy Skateboard, and you're listening to MissingRide.tv.